Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the special council meeting of the 7th of June, 2022. Um, I welcome you all and like to acknowledge that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to elders past and present. Um, we are having a hybrid meeting this evening. So we do have Councillor Iopolo and Councillor Wallace on Zoom, potentially Councillor Alexander might be joining us if he can get a connection. Um, and we'll just say if he does join us. Um, and we have uh, Director Miltrop on Zoom and in person. That's very clever. <laughs> um, so we also have apologies from Councillor Susan Gondoshevsky, who is on approved leave of absence from the 7th of June to the 10th of June. And just noting that if Councillor Alexander is not able to join us, he is actually on approved leave of absence also. So um, I will open for question time and receiving of public statements. I did check earlier and understand that we had not received any written statements and we don't have anyone joining us here um, this evening in the chamber. So um, I'll close public question time and I'll go to the CEO to see if there are any declarations of interest. Thank you, Meko, none received. Thank you, CEO. So we do have one item of business this evening, and that is our differential rating strategy for 22-23. Now, just to give a bit of an outline of the process, we do have um, we do have the Director, um, Virginia Miltrop, here to present to us um, on the budget. So what I will do is I'll call for a mover and second. I will then go to the presentation we can take any questions arising from the presentation or any general questions, and then I'll go back to the mover and seconder to commence the debate. So can I please call for a mover for the item 5.1? Moved by Councillor Castle, seconded by Councillor Warner. Um, Director, would you like to take off with your presentation? Thank you very much. Thank you, I will. Um, so, Mayor Cole, um, I have a presentation um, regarding the City of Vincent's proposed budget and rate setting for the new financial year, which I will take you through. Um, there are some key themes for this budget. Uh, it continues our focus on long-term sustainability, um, and we're, we're definitely going through a process of maturing our approach to how we manage our finances and how we manage our assets. Um, in the agenda pack, you will see that there is a revenue and rating plan to provide transparency, and it should say to the community. So um, that is a document that we've prepared that lays out how the city generates its revenue from various sources. And then as, with regards to rates, it, it explains how we do that. The budget responds to key challenges that we're experiencing at the moment. Um, the city did lose about $4.7 million in revenue over the past two years due to COVID. And uh, at the moment, we're also experiencing inflationary pressures. We are preparing for a once in a generation underground power project. I'll discuss that in a moment. And we continue with our focus on service delivery and efficiency. Our capital works program for a few years, we have been focused on uh, uh, looking at asset renewal, and um, we are also this year looking at completing a series of very large projects that are government funded. There is a proposal that is included in our revenue, which is to reduce free parking in city-owned car parks from one hour to 30 minutes. So that's the first hour um, free would change to the first 30 minutes free. Um, that is, uh, generates a, an additional revenue for the city of $1 million. And from a ratepayers perspective, it would equate to a rate increase of 2.8% if, if it was done as a rate increase. And obviously we would prefer um, not to do that. There is a proposed uh, rate increase overall of 7.6%. And this includes a 2.1% um, provision that goes towards the underground power project. I'll walk very quickly through the rate setting statement. I've had some questions from members of the community, so I thought it would be helpful to explain 
how a local government builds its budget. So the first thing uh, that I will show you, and the, what we use is the rate setting statement to build our budget. The rate setting statement is included in the agenda pack. The, the first thing I'll mention is that revenue overall has increased um, by $2 million or 9.25%, which includes that car parking I mentioned a moment ago. And our operating expenditure has decreased by $4.1 million, which um, is about 5.77%. So that is a um, the deficit, the overall deficit that you see there has actually reduced by $6.1 million or 12.34%. The next part of our rate setting statement is the grants. So our non-operating grants in this financial year um, has have increased by 50% um, to one um, and by amount of 1.6 million. Um, some of those are multi-year projects and some of them may have actually been moved from one year to the next. So it does vary um, quite a bit from year to year. We are looking at a sale of land and uh, included in the asset disposal is $900,000 um, for the sale of, of land um, for the city. That land sale will go into reserve. So I've had a question from a member of the community about are we selling assets to fund our budget? No, we're not. We're, we're selling assets to fund future projects. We're, we're using that land in, in, in a better way. Um, the other thing that's included in asset disposal is um, often it's a sale of, uh, of motor vehicles or trade-in of motor vehicles, so sometimes that's in there as well. And we have a joint venture. We're a part owner in the Tamala Park, Reserve, uh, Tamala Park and uh, we generate revenue from that each year. Um, we're anticipating that that will be $1.25 million, and that will, again, go into reserve for building um, uh, finances for future projects. I mentioned um, the underground power. Um, so we will be building a, a rolling fund. So in the transfer to reserves that you can see there of $4.2 million, it includes the Sydney, the um, sale of land, it includes Tamala Park revenue, and it also includes revenue that is generated from rates um, that is going to fund the underground power project. And then finally, we're left with a, um, a budget that is in a surplus position of $132,000. You can see there that the total rates um, yield has gone up by 8.67%, while we are talking about a 7.6% increase to rates. The difference between those two figures is typically... Um, um, organic or interim rates um, adjustments. I mentioned a moment ago that we are responding to uh, the impact on COVID. As I talk about 7.6% rate increase, really uh, that reflects the fact that over the last two years, we've had no increases to commercial rates. We've had a slight increase to residential I've got a figure there of 1.5, that should actually be 2.4, that's an error. And so we see the 7.6% as, as being broken down to 5.5% um, and then the 2.1% that goes into the underground power reserve. That equates for the, uh, for the median property owner in Vincent, a residential median property, that would equate to $2 per week or $104 per year. It's helpful for our ratepayers to understand what that means um, in terms of whether or not that is good value or not. Um, we've created a bit of a picture here of the city of Vincent sitting amongst its near, near neighbours. And uh, by um, a lot of comparisons, we're actually a very good value council. Um, in the, the neighbouring councils you see there, we are the second lowest to the city of Stirling. And the, the graph that you see on the top left there, um, we are actually the sixth lowest rating council um, in the metropolitan area. Even if we were to come up to the middle of the pack, that would be a 17% increase. I mentioned a moment ago about parking charges of $1 million um, in revenue. So just very quickly to discuss that, 
the proposal is to, um, to shift it from one hour free to 30 minutes free. Um, this shifts the cost of providing that service to the users of that service um, rather than ratepayers. And uh, we also know that the population, that, that has been in place since 2011. And over that time, the population and use of cars has, has increased. And so we're really noticing a different pattern of behaviour in our car parks now. It, uh, in addition to generating revenue, this supports a shift to other transport modes. It encourages people not to use cars. And, uh, and we know that 83% um, of users of our car parks are actually non-rate payers. And we believe that that will actually um, assist us to, um, assist our ratepayers by um, passing that that expense on to those who use those car parks. We have given some thought um, with regards to this change in how we manage uh, people who are the more vulnerable in our community. We have some transition and support programs there for them, and I also just point out that ACROD users are not impacted by these changes. I mentioned a moment ago that uh, while we that we consider our um, other ways that we generate revenue for the city, there is a document that we've created, the revenue and rating plan I mentioned a moment ago, and that provides a lot of information for people about how we go about generating revenue. And I think when we're talking about a rate increase of 7.6%, it's important for people to understand that we also look at a lot of other ways to generate revenue apart from rates. 62.6% um, of our operating revenue comes from rates. And that's actually a little bit less than the WA Metro average of 63.6%. Other user charges uh, you can see there make up about 33% of our operating revenue. And a big part of that is car parking I mentioned a moment ago. Um, we also have BD Park Leisure Centre membership fees and they've increased that by 3% this year. I'll take a note to, uh, moment to mention that BD Park is um, expected to uh, deliver an operating surplus of $300,000 this year. So they are actually starting to pay their way. And I'll talk in a moment about um, how we're going to use, use those funds. And you can see various other things there that we do to generate revenue. I won't go through those right now. We mentioned underground power. Um, and I also mentioned that that is, that is a really big part of how we're going to, um, uh, the rate increase of 2.1% is a really big part of, of introducing underground power to the city. The way we're going to do that is 785,000 will go into our reserve and we will continue to build that reserve year on year. Um, that will allow us to support um, rate payers um, through the process of, of implementing underground power. Um, we're going to need to basically cash flow big parts of the project and um, we'll need to build a, build a fund to do that. Once we've gone through one project, we'll be able to um, use that reserve to actually fund future projects of, um, for, for different parts of the city. So it will be a, um, an ongoing fund. Very quickly, uh, we talked a moment ago about operating expenditure decreasing by 5.77% or $4.1 million. That's in the context of some, some quite significant pressures, external pressures. Underlying those figures, even though I'm reporting a decrease in expenditure, um, there are some notable increases. So materials and contracts, um, while overall they are down, we're definitely seeing um, upward pressure on our materials and contracts arising from um, the, the current environment that we're in, particularly construction costs um, uh, with regards to our capital works. We've uh, included in there about $200,000 worth of IT projects and also another $200,000 for Landgate's um, triennial revaluation is in there as well. I want to take a moment to mention employee costs because that has increased by 6.7% and that's sort of a fairly significant move. Um, just to explain that staff did take a salary freeze for one year 
um, during um, COVID, and that allowed us to then um, hold um, the city to a 0% rate increase. They took a minimal increase in 21-22, but we're definitely noticing that we are have fallen behind um, comparable um, positions in the external market and our staff um, are, um, when we do lose our staff, um, we are noticing that it, it is to do with revenue, um, with remuneration, I should say. So you can see there, we're actually budgeting a 3.5% EBA increase. There is the um, standard 0.5% super increase. We've also added in another 250,000 to assist us with some of those market adjustments, which are becoming quite pressing. Um, there's some other um, adjustments there, $200,000 for BD Park Casuals, although that is to support the delivery of $477,000 worth of revenue. And you can see some other minor changes there as well, workers' comp insurance, an Aboriginal trainee program and additional funds for staff training. Just want to take a moment, I think, uh, given that we're talking about a 7.6% rate increase, I think it's important for us to also talk about how we're managing our business um, and that we need, we're very conscious of needing to do that in a very efficient way and to be very responsible with, um, with our community's money. Um, we have been going through a process of maturing our, um, our management um, frameworks. And so I just want to point out that we do have an annual service review where we look, we critically review how we deliver services and look for opportunities for improvement. Over the last couple of years, we've put in place contract management frameworks, procurement frameworks, project management frameworks, um, a property management framework. And we're starting to add rigor around our four-year capital works program, our four-year business planning processes, and supported by our audit committee, which has got an external chair, which is actually um, best practice. So we're adding to that with this revenue and rating plan that I've talked about. And we're also refreshing our long-term financial plan. And both of those documents are planned to come to council um, in August. On the right-hand side there, you can see where we, um, the City of Vincent participated in a benchmarking program. It was run by PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC. And it was a very rigorous benchmarking program. So this is dated 30th of June, 2020. But what you can see there is how your, your City of Vincent, your organisation actually stands up against um, the, the, um, comparison, the comparative organisations. Um, so we compared ourselves both against the Australian New Zealand cohort, which is about 138 organisations. And we also compared ourselves to Metropolitan WA. And you can see there that on the whole, we actually are, are running very efficiently. So you can see our staffing ratios are, um, on, are on par. Our employment costs um, comparatively are on par. The areas where we are falling behind are capital expenditure, which we're aware of. Um, our spending on roads, our IT investment at that time was definitely low and that has been an audit finding and we're adjusting that that has actually been significantly increased. And our staff development, we um, weren't putting as much money into that. So the areas that you see in red are definitely in focus and are being improved. Just as I um, start to wrap this up, um, I just want to mention that there is a capital um, budget um, of $15.1 million, which is um, on the back of a depreciation rate of $12.9 million. Um, why that's important is that we want to make sure that we are delivering a renewal program that covers depreciation and that the total renewal program um, is, is worth about $11 million. So we're actually pleased with that. Um, the asset sustainability figures for the city have been quite poor. We haven't been investing enough in capital works and we are um, year on year um, getting much better at that. You can see also the important thing on the right hand side I want to point out is even though we have a $15.1 million um, program, if you look at the funding source on the top right hand um, table there, um, only about $5.5 million of that is coming out of ratepayers funds this year. 
um, the, re the remaining parts of that are either being funded from reserve or our savings accounts where we have put money away for these projects um, or grant, um, grant funding from third parties or third party contributions. And that's normally where we have, um, say for example, a tenant who is contributing money towards a project. So $5.5 million of that is being funded by ratepayers this year. A couple of um, projects of note, $4.6 million of that relates to, brick, to the really the basic stuff of local government, roads, drainage, footpaths, parks and playgrounds. And I mentioned a moment ago, um, BD Park is a big part of our organisation. Um, there's $1.6 million worth of projects there, but I'd just like to point out for that 1.6, $750,000 of that is for the indoor pool change rooms, which is grant funded. $250,000 of that is for the Heritage Grandstand Electrics to be updated, which is already been planned for and is, and is in reserve. The balance of that is $500,000 worth of projects of which 300,000 is actually being delivered by BD Park themselves through a surplus position this year. So uh, I'm, I'm actually really pleased in, um, by the fact that $1.6 million, um, yes, it's being funded by BD Park and, and the city to the tune of 500, but um, BD Park is actually starting to contribute much more significantly to their, to their own upkeep, if you like. Other um, capital works projects that um, the community might be interested in, Leaderville Oval, we're looking at doing some sports lights there. Only 164,000 of that is coming from the city. The rest is coming from other parties. Solar panels are going to be tenant funded. Robertson Park, we're refurbishing the courts and, and uh, setting up a multi-sports environment. Um, $100,000 of that comes from external grants. Mount Hawthorne Youth Skate Park is 230,000, but 200 of that is from grant funding. Hain Street Reserve is 340,000, but you can see that um, we're required to deliver those works um, as per an agreement, um, but it will be funded by sale of land I mentioned before. Banks Reserve, we're putting some toilets in there for 200,000. We're doing some technology upgrades for 250,000 and I mentioned that's an audit finding, so that's a priority for us. Um, fleet management, you can see we're, we're getting a road sweeper. Um, we're getting a five tonne rubbish compactor. And um, it's also interesting to note with our light fleet, we are constantly refreshing our light fleet. Um, the light fleet program is, um, we spend 899,000, but we actually have a trade-in value of 648 because we have a buyback scheme there. Public um, artwork of $162,000 is planned, um, but that will come from the percent for art reserve, which must be used for that purpose. The bike network and also down the bottom there, the accessible city implementation, there's about $800,000 worth of works there, but once again, funded from a, a specific purpose reserve that needs to be used for that purpose and can't be used elsewhere. And then finally, the Beaufort Street Art Deco lights um, are going to be renewed, which is well overdue. I've had um, members of the community ask me about debt, so I just want to quickly talk about that. We will be paying down our debt by $1.6 million this year. We won't be taking out any new debt and um, our our different loans that we have are itemised there. What you can see from those is the first two loans are actually paid by um, the, they're basically paid by the tenant. Um, BD Park is now covering its loans for the $5 million loan and their equipment upgrade. So where I discussed before about the $300,000 surplus, that's after they've actually paid for those two loans. So those loans are effectively being, um, uh, paid for by BD Park members. The, uh, the final part of that, the resource recovery facility of 6.7 million was a really big addition last year. And uh, the reason that we did that loan was that it was a positive business case for us to actually exit that contract over the long term. And we, we saved the city money by paying that now rather than staying in that contract for the, for the um, 10 or 15 years that it was due to, to um, continue.
Very, um, as we conclude, uh, we'll just take a moment to discuss differential rates. So you'll see in the, um, in the documents there that we, we look at the, um, the general rate for the city, which is taken from a budget deficiency, which comes from that rate setting statement document I mentioned a moment ago. And then we divide that by the total gross rental values for, the, for all Vincent properties. So if we take those two figures, we end up with a general rate, um, which is, um, you can see there, is a rate in the dollar of 0 0.085. Now we then apply that rate in the dollar um, differentially. So we apply it to different groups um, according to um, some ratios. And I just want to quickly mention that I've just talked about the general rate. If we use that as our baseline of 100%, then um, our residential differential rate typically sits on or about that general rate. So it typically sits at the 100% mark. And the reason that that makes sense is that 74% of our value of our um, property values are residential. So it makes sense that the residential rate payer is making a reasonable contribution to the share of that rate load. You can see that commercial and industrial sit at about 85% of the general rate. That lower commercial rate is designed to support local businesses who were impacted by um, COVID-19. And you can see that the vacant commercial rate sits at 162% of that general rate. And the reason that um, that's a, a clear strategic point, um, a higher vacant commercial rate encourages commercial development. So with those two pieces that I just mentioned, that then brings us to the proposed differential rates that you see in front of you and that are in the pack, which um, equate to a 7.6% increase to both the rate in the dollar and the minimum rate. Finally, um, we do have a financial hardship scheme. Um, we provide rate smoothing for all rate payers. Um, we encourage any ratepayers who are experiencing financial hardship to contact us. Um, there is a hardship fund that has been established, which is worth about $50,000. And we have a number of different deferment and repayment plans that are available for ratepayers who need it. And I will leave it there. Thank you, Mekol. Thank you very much, Director. I really appreciate that very comprehensive overview of the rate setting statement and also some information about the draft budget. That was very valuable. Um, I will open it up for questions. Do council members have any questions based on the presentation? Oh, no questions. No questions? I'll, I'll ask a question. No. no. <laughs> I just thought one thing that I thought might be worth mentioning just on the debt. I think we've talked about how we have um, exciting projects afoot to, um, you know, to potentially alleviate that debt. And I thought potentially um, the issue with MRC hmm. and that they're looking into um, whether that facility, which was we had one twelfth share in and the land could yep. potentially be leased or sold and what yep. implication that might have. Yeah, um, so you're quite right, Mayor Cole. The revenue and rating plan that I mentioned a moment ago talks about the fact that um, in addition to sort of our, our normal um, processes, we also look at new ways to either generate revenue or pay down debt. Um, the Mindari Regional Council, which we're a one twelfth owner, there's definitely some discussion there about whether or not they um, sale or lease their land. Um, so that would actually be a new um, revenue stream for us and we could use that as a windfall opportunity to pay down debt for sure. Um, we also have some other projects, they're outlined in that document, but for example, um, the community will be aware that we um, have gone out to market to explore um, development opportunities for our leadable car parks. Um, there is land there where, that we can potentially use um, at, in, in a better way. Um, for both the community and for the city. And that could also be um, opportunities for new, for new revenue and to pay down debt. So there's certainly different things that are in that document in a lot more detail than we've covered tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, we're always looking for those opportunities. Debt will be paid down by $1.6 million this year. 
Thank you very much, Director. Are there any other questions for the Director? Okay, thank you again. Really appreciate all the hard work that you and the Manager of Finance have put into this. Um, very much appreciated. Okay, I'll go to the mover, Councillor Castle. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, I'm supportive of the motion as, as it's written, and I also want to thank Virginia and Reese, particularly for the hard work that you put in through this whole process. It's certainly been a very detailed process that we've been through, and I very much appreciated the presentation because it does actually set out a lot of the foundations for how we've landed at this proposed rate um, increase for this year. It's never an easy thing to propose that for a community, and we're very aware of the um, cost of living pressures that are around at the moment and the general environment that makes a rate rise always a difficult thing to propose. But I am confident that this is a move that reflects responsible and sensible financial management for the city. Um, as you've outlined, we've had um, a number of years of, of underspend on some key projects, including roads um, and a lot of our asset management. We've been on a path to improving that position through the development of our asset management plan, through a lot of um, discussions about how we can improve those ratios. And I think this is a continuation of that financial maturity that we've been striving. Um, we've also had audit findings that have identified where we really needed to increase spend. So um, there's, there's a lots of really solid foundation for the decisions that we're making here today. Um, we also reflect on the way the underspend on wages that we've been that has been experienced by our staff in particularly in the last two years. And we're starting to see that in, in turnover. It's really vital that if we want to continue the level of service that we provide at Vincent, that we continue to attract and retain the high quality staff that we have. So I think that's a really important step. And as most people um, are aware, Vincent, like all other businesses and councils are experiencing um, pressures with rising cost of materials given the current climate. So that's also putting pressure on our spend. Um, I think obviously some of the really exciting news out of this budget um, or this rate rise proposal is the 2.1% towards underground power. That's a project that our community has been talking about for many, many years. This is the best opportunity we've ever had for the, to deliver this, um, as you described it, a once in a generation project. Um, and I think it is really important that we not only plan for what has been offered right now, but for the future, because it's certainly um, the hope and the goal of this council that that can be rolled out across the entire city. So I think that's a really good first step in ensuring that we can manage that going forward um, and that we're prepared for the next stages that might be offered by Western Power. Um, as with all of these, these um, budgets, when we're going through the process, it's not just what extra revenue, what extra income we need, um, but also what savings we can achieve. And I'm really um, impressed and thankful that uh, of the savings that have been found by administration. $4.1 million in reduction in operation expenditure is significant, and um, it has gone away to keeping that rise down. So I'm feeling pretty confident that we have identified savings and really conscious of the level of service that our community expects from Vincent and that we don't that we can achieve those savings without um, without reducing that level of service. Uh, I want to just briefly talk about parking that's something that we will be specifically consulting with the community on it is a change on on a position that we've had for quite some time um, but it is important as as was outlined in the um, presentation that we don't just look to our ratepayers to fund the the works that we need to do in Vincent and that we do try to spread the load and I'm, I'm very pleased to see that our ratios and our percentages of income are benchmarked against other councils. I think it is important that we recognise that a measure like that is a savings of 2.8% rates to our ratepayers and that actually spreads that load not only to the people who, who live in Vincent who use um, our car parks, but also to all our visitors. I was really interested to see the, um, the spend map data that said 83% of visitors to Leaderville don't, don't live in the city of Vincent. So that's a really important indicator that not just the, the ratepayers of Vincent are sharing that load and 
and benefiting, uh, uh, contributing towards the benefit that we see in our town centres. So I think that's a really, um, really positive step and we'll be really interested to see the consultation on that as it goes forward. And finally, I just think that um, what, what it's, it's really important to see when you look at big numbers like 7.6%, how that actually equates on that medium GRV that we're talking about $2 a week. That's not something that you take lightly, but it's also not a massive um, hit in the, in the dollar in the pocket each week. Um, I don't drink coffee, but apparently it's a lot less than a cup of coffee. Um, so I think that's important to keep that perspective and that even with this, this rise, we're still one of the lowest rating councils in the metro area. And I think given the, the level of service that we provide, um, that's pretty good value. And, and I think on that basis, I'm comfortable um, to move in this direction. Thank you, Councillor Castle. Councillor Warner, seconder. Uh, really, I can't say much more than that. Thanks, Alex. You just took all the words out of my mouth. Uh, but no, I'm supportive of this and appreciative to Virginia and her team for putting this together. Thank you. Councillors, Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I said Councillor Castle. Um, this is probably the most challenging budget I've been involved in since being on council. Um, if it was a popularity contest, we'd definitely be losing, I suspect. Um, but it's also probably the best budget I've been involved in because it's actually a genuinely reforming budget. Um, it's finally dealing with this issue of asset sustainability that we have in our assets. Um, for context, we've probably been spending about nine million a year on our assets and we need to spend 14 million. So that's about a five million gap. Um, and to put that in a, a number context, that's about a 15% increase in rates. Um, in addition, this budget also addresses the unfunded master plans that we have that have been sitting on our list to do, addresses our staff salaries, and also deals with the fact that we had a rate freeze for two years under the COVID uh, situation we were dealing with. So that starting point going into this budget was quite high. You can sort of do the numbers on your hands there and see that we're starting with something around about the 20% mark, right? Um, as Alex said, we had the asset sustainability issue, the audit action that has been seen that we need to address. Um, the logical thing is how can we start off by reducing our assets? And this has been a process over a number of years for how we can reduce that burden. Um, we have a number of examples where we've done that, where we've uh, uh, knocked over disused toilet blocks. We uh, knocked over the buildings down at Banks Reserve. We received a significant amount of feedback from the community on both of those in, in on a lot of those cases. Um, and those were the ones that we saw as the underused assets. Um, so from my point of view, I didn't see that there was much more that we could do in terms of reducing our buildings. Uh, we also have to maintain our roads and our footpaths, which rep represents about 40% uh, of the cost that we have there. That is an obligation that we have and we get in trouble with the federal government if we do not maintain our roads properly. Um, we could probably convert them all into reserves, but um, we'll, that's a conversation for another day. Uh, I won't put an amendment for it, don't worry. Um, but so when you start from that base of needing to increase the amount of uh, revenue that we bring in to maintain our, all our assets, um, the starting point for that is ultimately from rates. Um, but then we've gone through this process with administration over the last six months to reduce our costs across the city. Um, and as, as it's outlined, $4.1 million is not a small amount of money. Um, and then looked at alternative revenue sources and particularly the half hour reducing from one hour to half hour free parking is a big shift. Um, it's not gonna be massively popular, I suspect with uh, parts of our community, but this is really about uh, sharing that, that load and that responsibility at the end of the day, I think everybody needs to be equally um, annoyed, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, I ultimately, I support this, this budget. I think this is stri strikes that right balance between budget savings without removing the core services that we are obliged to deliver as a local government, but also the things that our community have come to expect. Um, and I've personally been through the budget line by line and considered each of those items and where those costs are, what those costs are, including the associated headcount for those people. And to my view, those items all represent value for money in terms of the expectations of the community. Not every person is gonna want every single one of those items in there, um, but on, on the whole, we share that load across our city 
um, so that we have parks, so that we have um, community facilities that we can access, so we can go for a swim at Beatty Park, so we can do all the things that we want to do, as well as doing all the core things like picking up rubbish, maintaining our footpaths, our roads and our buildings as well. Um, so uh, I look forward to listening to the debate, but from my point of view, I'm happy to support the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Loden. Um, councils in Zoom land, any comments? Councillor Apollo? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I actually thought today was, we we're not really discussing budget per se, but um, voting on whether we're happy for administration to advertise. But since so many other councillors have made comments regarding the underlying budget, um, I, I guess I can say a few words. Um, <clears throat> You know, I think I think there's a lot of parts of this budget which make sense. Um, you know, as a chartered accountant of 25 years, um, you know, I've still got some questions regarding some of the operational expenditure. I know a comment was made about how the city had reduced its uh, its operational spend from last year by 4.1 million, but I think that includes, if I'm not mistaken, uh, an anomaly of a seven million dollar uh, you know increase that was incurred this year for the um, the RRF buyout. So if you took that into account, um, operational expenditure actually increased. But I, I guess from my point of view, the, the, the concerns that, you know, um, I'm interested in, in getting the community feedback about the rates is obviously the, the reduction in the one hour parking to 30 minutes. So I, I look forward to seeing the community's uh, reaction and feedback on that. Um, because there is some concern about what that could do to our urban centres. Um, and the vibrancy of them, um, given that we've, I guess, as a council, invested uh, a lot of money in, the, in over the years with our um, town teams and place managers who are obviously managing those areas. Um, I guess from my point of view too, the, I mean, if I, we look at operational spend from the last completed financial year, FY21, to now, um, costs have actually gone up by 10 million or 17%. Um, and if you include CapEx with that, then we're talking about 26% increase um, from FY21. Um, I would have hoped that we could have delved a little bit more deeply into savings and then not relied on a rate increase. But um, you know, I'll reserve the judgment on all that. I, I look forward to the community feedback on what's being proposed. I do agree with um, the other councillors saying that this is a challenging budget. Um, I'm happy that there is a reduction in debt um, that is something that I'm very uh, happy to hear um, because we don't want to be kicking the can down the road and, and not dealing with that. And to be repaying part of that um, maximum debt this year is, is quite pleasing. Um, so uh, that's, that's pretty much it for me. I, I am supportive of obviously um, advertising administration's um, proposed rates uh, and um, look forward to feedback and um, debating the budget in, in a month's time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Apollo. Councillor Wallace or Councillor Hallett, do you have anything to add? Okay, thank you very much. I'll just make a few quick comments. I'll try not to repeat too much what has already been said, but um, I really I really like Councillor Loden's words that this is a reforming budget. I think that's quite... Um, quite a good way to describe it because I do think for me I look at this budget and I see it tries to confront three quite key issues. It's It responds to the impact of COVID-19 where the city lost revenue, the staff took a salary freeze um, and, it talk, and it talks to the issues of um, quite rampant inflation and pressures um, on cost of projects, materials and insurance and wages and you know the staffing issue has been discussed and just today I learned of another staff who, member who's leaving due to salary. So it is real and um, it's something with me being in the office most days, um, separate in my separate area, but I do have high levels of interaction with the staff and I, I see this happening and I know it to be a genuine real issue that we are losing good people. Um, one of the things I think being a council member through COVID is it did teach me that we do travel um, we, we run lean at Vincent. So sitting on the COVID committee with Councillor Castle and Councillor Gontoshevsky, we really did go through that sort of really deep look at our operations and 
you know, we, we sort of really pared back where we could and we made some pretty drastic decisions at the time around what we, what we could and couldn't offer. And we realised that there's really not a lot of, there's not a lot of fat. And when you talk to staff and see the work that staff are doing, you know that everyone's working incredibly hard, that, um, that we're, we're sort of quite a lean machine and we do rely on every single staff member that we have working here at the City of Vincent. So I, I like Councillor Loden and like others have gone through the budget and really scrutinised it. Look at the Capital Works program. This again, this is the draft budget and, and there still could be changes, but it is really looking at the fact that there's not, um, there's, there's no glamour projects. There's nothing um, that sort of particularly I, that catches your eye. It's all very much a focus on renewal, a focus on delivery of our programs and services and projects that the community has come to expect. And when you know we talk about savings and administration says, well, how would you feel about running one native plant sale a year other, rather than two? We just know that's not going to wash in the Vincent community because these things are deeply popular. And they also have really great um, environmental and wellbeing outcomes for our community. So it's really important to us that we continue to do what can be seen as discretionary, but perhaps is not quite that discretionary in the city of Vincent when the community has such a high value on things like tree planting and some of our sustainability initiatives, which, which um, are really important to the community. Um, we're dealing with that critical issue of asset sustainability, and it was really fantastic for me to see that we're angling for an asset sustainability ratio of 0 0.85. Um, the ratio that, uh, that the local government um, department would like us to get to is 0 0.9, but this is the closest that we have come in so many, ever, I think, and we're absolutely on that trajectory. And I think that a lot of groundwork came through our asset sustainability strategy, which we adopted about a year and a half ago. And we really have been very open and upfront with our community about what our issues are and where we need to do better. And this budget is really about tackling those. So the third aspect of this is underground power, which is incredibly exciting for the city of Vincent. Call us that famous ice skater that came in from behind and skated through when everyone else fell over. I don't mind, but we have got the best deal from Western Power that we have been offered in forever. I think you probably have to go back 20 years to be offered underground power at these prices. And it is an absolute gift. Um, it still does result in payment, but it's significantly less than anything that we've um, ex we expected. A $50 million project where residents will be required to provide $17 million. And of course, we do need to underwrite that because we want our, our residents and commercial properties to be able to pay that back in a way that's sustainable and manageable. So this rolling fund is not just about supporting those residents that are lucky enough to be in that first one third of all ratepayers, which is substantial, a whole third of the City of Vincent's ratepayers to get underground power within a two year period. Um, we've told Western Power we're keen to do as much as possible under this program if we meet the criteria, we're absolutely keen. And we hope to hear more from them potentially later this year. We don't know, it's really up to them to make the call. Um, but this is an incredible program. The rating of 2.1% will underwrite that program. It will effectively operate like the financing of longer payback periods. So the money will go out and as residents pay that back or rate payers pay that back, it comes back in. So it's a rolling fund where the funding then becomes available for future projects. So it's not just to be of benefit to those in the first three projects, but as we grow that and, and the money comes rolling back in, it will become available to others as we try to progress underground power further through the city of Vincent. Um, just to, to respond that I know that um, I'll probably be called by 6PR tomorrow to say 7.6%, that is a, a bit of a headline figure, but I think you need to look at these things. All local governments are very different. And when you look at the city of Vincent, because we have been a low rating council, what that actually equates to, we've, we've discussed it, I won't sort of bang on about it, but it is $2 a week. So you might have another council that might be doing a 4% rate increase, but they might be rating much higher than us. And that increase could have um, just as much impact, if not more. So you really need to look at each local government, its own circumstances, where they're sitting, with us being the sixth lowest, um, we will still be way cheaper than a lot of our neighbouring councils, even after a 7.6% rate increase. So it does need to be looked at in its context and it needs to be looked at in terms of what we're actually delivering with underground power being a key part of that. Um, 
the look, I do, I have been a really strong advocate for first hour free and Vincent since I joined council in 2013. It's been raised with us in the past. Should we look at this? This is a revenue stream which is not reliant on ratepayers. Um, but I think that this is the first time where we've genuinely felt that it is time based not on purely on revenue, but based on our accessible city strategy, which actually says we need to have demand driven pricing on our car parking. We need to encourage car parking churn. We need to make sure that more visitors are coming and that when particularly when you look at the bulk of the bays and, and it will uh, primarily impact um, Leadable, also parts of Beaufort Street, but this is the, the largest number of bays are in Leadable and anyone who visits Leadable will know that you're fighting for car bays in Leadable. These car bays are in demand and this is actually a way in which we meet our, asset, um, sorry, our accessible city strategies goal to try to encourage not just alternate transport, but also to have car park pricing reflect the demand that's happening in the car parking so that our businesses can have that turnover in the car park and have more people visiting. I think we also need to, if, if this is successful and we can, um, you know, have that conversation with our community first, which is incredibly important, we would also need to really promote our Easy Park app because that just transforms the way people deal with parking. And I think anyone who's on the Easy Park app knows it's just so much more manageable and you're less, um, you know, you're just more interested in having a good parking experience and actually worrying about exactly how many cents it's costing you. So, um, so based on our current situation where we're the lowest rate, we've been through some really strong measures to do as much as we could for our community at the time. Um, we did recently survey our businesses and it was surprising that not many were aware that they had had a freeze for two years on their rates. So, you know, we do have to sort of somehow communicate these things better because that that is a really important thing that we did that. That was a critical measure during COVID and our um, residents saw just 2.4%. One year they did have a freeze. So, um, so a lot to um, consider here. It has been a bit of a, a tough process, but I think when you see the conversations we've been having with our community about our financial sustainability, what we've been doing in terms of our long-term financial planning, our, um, our asset planning, and um, where we're at with Imagine Vincent, where we've recently gone back out to the community and said, how do our priorities look for you? Are we still um, valuing the things that you value? The preliminary indicator is, is that we're still on the right track there. So they're not saying stop doing that. But they're not in sort of saying to us, rein in the spending. They are saying that they value those things that we have been doing under our, um, our community strategic community plan, which is our key guiding document. And just to conclude by saying that consultation will open tomorrow. Um, we've tried to make that as easy for people to engage as possible. So you won't be required to register before you enter into the Imagine Vincent portal. You can simply come online. You can choose to do a short survey on the rates. You can choose to do a short survey on car parking, or you can choose to do both. Um, and you also have the option of sending us emails if, the, if you don't want to take on a survey format or um, contacting us in other ways. So, um, so very, very keen to hear what people have to say. This will be open for three weeks for consultation and then we'll be coming back here in a month's time to look at um, having the discussion about the budget proper and considering that feedback provided. Um, Councillor Castle, do you wish to close debate? Okay. Does anyone else who hasn't spoken wish to speak? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Just noting that Councillor Alexander did pop up briefly, but hasn't been here for the debate or the vote. Just to, just to clarify, I think he's having um, connection issues as he is um, away at the moment. So, but it was um, good of him to make the effort when he's on approved leave, appreciate that. So um, that is our, concludes our business for this evening. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us. If you'd like to comment, please visit tomorrow, probably by lunchtime, imaginevincent.wa.gov.au, and you'll see a lot of um, additional information available. We will have the report, the presentation, and the surveys available online. So thank you, everybody, and I declare the meeting closed at 6.54 p.m.